Father, we thank you for your goodness and blessing and your presence with us this day. Help us now in these moments that we may gain information that will enhance our regard for your word and our desire to share it with others. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we are on tonight, chapter 28, which is on page 511 in the text, page 20, 511, chapter 28, and we're on uh, translations containing both the Old and the New Testament text and uh, valuable information. Let's drop down to the first major heading on page 511, the language of the early church, Syriac or Aramaic. Uh, it says in line three in that paragraph, it was a common language of the market. That was only locally. Remember that the common language for the entire Roman Empire from all the way from Spain over to India was was Greek and uh, all of southern Europe, all of northern Africa, it was Greek. But in the area around Palestine, that is the eastern end, the countries at the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea, it was Aramaic. This was the language that was predominant and, and spoken there. Uh, Hebrew was for the synagogue, uh, not, not the home, not the street, not the marketplace. And uh, that is strange, of course, because Hebrew is the language of Israel today, though it was not such at the time of Jesus. But uh, it, the next paragraph where, or line where it says, the language common to that entire region. That, that's not, not the entire empire. Uh, so, Syri old Syriac manuscripts, and we're on page 515 already, we're moving. Uh, other Syriac versions, oh, or wait, let's go back to 514 at the very bottom the old Syriac manuscripts, the diatessaron. Uh, th this was really a harmony of the Gospels and uh, it comes very early and is in that, in that language again. And then uh, page 515, you should be underlining other Syriac virgins, third line down, in that paragraph in 508, a new Syriac Testament was completed. We're over to page 516, Coptic. Uh, the Copts are the people, C-O-P-T-S, who lived in Egypt, North Africa. As it says in the last paragraph on this page, which you should underline, the Coptic dialect of Upper Egypt was Sahadi. And uh, still today, of course, the branch of Christendom in Egypt is, is Coptic and uh, some interesting things going on there. One church has a tip toward a evangelicalism. And then another dialect on page 517, the Boharic. It was in Lower Egypt. And then we're still in Africa. Other versions, 517, bottom of page 517, Ethiopic version, and this goes way back. Those people uh, really trace their origin uh, back to the fellow who was converted under Philip, Deacon Philip in Acts chapter 8, who was from Ethiopia, an ancient, ancient uh, country. 
519, Armenian version. The Armenian people are an ancient people going back to 1500 BC at least and still exist today though there have been attempts almost to wipe, wipe them out. Now don't get confused. There are two words that are similar and I hear sometimes people, uh, they're not quite sure where they're at. There's, there are the Armenians. The Armenians are an ethnic group, a people, actually a nation. Uh, which is between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. It's a landlocked country. It has no port. And uh, the country is basically Christian, that is East, Eastern Orthodox, 94.5%. And uh, at one time, the Turks tried to wipe out the Armenians. And then also, uh, the Soviet Union absorbed it. It became uh, part of the USSR, but broke loose again in 1989 uh, when uh, the Soviet Union broke up and so there's an Armenian Republic today. So the Armenians are an ethnic group, a people, a nation, Armenia. Don't confuse it with the Armenians, uh, an I instead of an E. The Armenians are not an ethnic group, but it's a doctrinal, a theological position following the teaching basically of a Dutch theologian, Jacob Arminius, the 16th century, who opposed John Calvin. The Arminians, a doctrinal group, a theological position, these people teach basically that you uh, are quite involved in your salvation and that you can lose your salvation. So historically the Methodists fall into this category and all the people who come from the Methodists, the Salvation Army, the Nazarenes, the Free Methodists, uh, all of those people and, and the whole Pentecostal movement as well. All these people are Arminians, not Armenians, Arminians, and teach that you can lose your salvation. So don't get the two confused. Arminians, after Jacob Arminius, are a doctrinal position. Uh, do not believe that you're secure in your salvation. Uh, the Armenians are an ethnic group. Questions on this or are we on track? Are you with me? Uh, don't, don't confuse them. Yes? I have a question about Coptics. Coptics. Oh. I always thought that was, uh, is that a, a um, nationality or is that a at kind the, of at the present time, it's it's a branch of Christendom. Okay. The the Coptic Church in Egypt is similar to the Orthodox Eastern Orthodox churches, but it's very ancient. It goes way back. So, and, what and, are they talking about here? What are they talking about? The Coptics. They're talking about those people in Egypt. Okay, so it started there and then became a... It, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a branch of Christendom. 
Yes. So we've we've got. Did the Coptics have their own language though? Like in, it's tough about a translation here. Yes, uh, re religiously yes, but uh, the the people in Egypt uh, speak Arabic as as a rule, but it gives the language the dialect on page 516. It's and it's different in northern Egypt and southern Egypt. Now let's go into this paragraph on the very bottom of page 519. As the Syrian churches carried out their work of evangelism in the early centuries, they contributed to several, and you've, you're underlining, secondary translations of the Bible. Then those secondary translations are named because of the fact that they are not translated out of the original languages, but from translations of the originals. Uh, but the value of these, I want to go over now to the conclusion on page 523. This pretty well, without getting lost in the details of the chapter, pay a lot of attention to the summary and conclusion on page 523. The multitude of early versions of the Bible, now, why are we even mentioning them? demonstrates not only the universality of Christianity, it was all over the Roman Empire and into all these different cultures. And in uh, every, every country that had been absorbed by the Roman Empire, Christianity was present. A, a verse that's sometimes overlooked is Colossians 1.23, where Paul says, and this is about in the 60s A.D., he says, this gospel which was preached in every nation under heaven. This is an astounding thing. Uh, and uh, the early church historian uh, is on to this also. But Paul mentions it, that without the printing press, all Bibles were hand copied. Without radio, television, without uh, the transportation we have today, they walked uh, on the sea. They went by the wind, uh, there were no, no motors of any kind. I mean, this, it, it's just zero communication and zero transportation, almost. Uh, yes? Would it be safe to say then that Christianity was the fastest spreading religion of ever? That what? Christianity was the fastest spreading religion ever. Oh yeah. The fastest uh, over time. It, it went everywhere. And here, uh, that this was early, and another witness to the universality of Christianity is all these Bibles early in these different languages. And uh, so they're, they're working. So these early versions were on this summary paragraph, demonstrates not only the universality of Christianity, but the antiquity of the biblical text as well. These early versions provide some, you're underlining now, some of the earliest copies of the complete canon of Scripture. So they're back to 200 A.D., 170 A.D., Whereas these people who come and say the canon of Scripture was not completed until the fourth century, 
Oh, no, no, no. We have already dealt with that. The Old Testament was all settled by the time of Christ, Luke 24, 44. Uh, the New Testament was settled, and these early versions indicate that uh, it, it was settled as well. In many cases, they outdate the manuscript copies in Greek, that is, outdate their earlier, uh, because you have the, the big uh, manuscript copies, Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, coming around uh, 325, 350 A.D., and these versions come earlier than that, for sure. The Syrian church, for example, had begun the Peshitta in the second century. Tatian's diatessaron goes sometime prior to 170 A.D. Oh, why? So it, it follows. Then toward the bottom of this paragraph, ample evidence of the presence of the, your underlining, entire Bible during the second, third, and fourth centuries th that they give, they give witness to this. So that uh, you, you have, they're, they're evident that Christianity was all over the Roman Empire from Spain to India, up into Europe, and all across Northern Africa that it was into the various different cultures and countries, and, uh, and that it was early, early. Uh, and this chapter, though it may appear rather dry and dull at points, is powerful, making these uh, statements of the existence of the scriptures at that time. Questions? We're going to be moved, yes. Uh, at the, the last couple lines of the summary, they say the Ethiopic, the Coptic, they give the many translations. So yes. Coptic, does that just mean a Christian that's Egyptian? Yeah, yes, that's Egypt. Okay, so, because I hear about that in the news, like with the Middle East and stuff, they talk about the killing of Coptic Christians. Those Is are, those Christian are. Or specifically an Egyptian Christian. Those are the Christians uh, the main Christian group in Egypt. Okay. You hear about the Coptics. They're there today. And uh, there was one of their, quote, priests who uh, has become quite evangelical and is on television out of Cairo, and his whole church is tipping in that direction. It's, it's very interesting uh, away from all the I just got on a show last night when I got home. They, were, they claimed they had the ark there for a while. Hey. They did. Yeah, well, let them claim. Let them hide it. I don't think it's there. Yeah. Uh, okay. Do we have a, enough here? Let's pass these through. We're moving in now to what is perhaps one of the most bewildering things, all the, uh, the, the, the translations, uh, and, and here we go. This is sort of a preview. We're going to get down into the detail in the next weeks. Uh, Wy the Wycliffe Bible now, this, again, is before printing, so this is hand-copied. This is really the first Bible into the English language. It's not translated from the Greek and the Hebrew. It's translated from the Latin, the Latin Vulgate. But Wycliffe is important because it is the first Bible in the English language. Now, Tyndale, uh, you, you need to circle Tyndale. William Tyndale gave us the first printed English New Testament translated 
from the Greek. Uh, he got rewarded by being hung and the body burned. Uh, so it was not much, much appreciated. But 1525 is the date for the New Testament appearing. There, are only, there were only 3,000 printed and there are about two of those still in existence today only. Coverdale Bible, Matthew's Bible, Great Bible, uh, Geneva Bible, let's linger there for a moment. Uh, this was done by the Puritans in the Swiss town of Geneva, and that's why it's called the Geneva Bible. This was the Bible of the pilgrims. When they came to these shores, this is the Bible that they had. This is the Bible quoted in the Mayflower contract. This is the Bible in the early colonies that they had. The Reims Doye is really the first English translation for Roman Catholics. Now, uh, the authorized so-called, or the King James Version, is next. Uh, the King James Version uh, is mostly uh, Tyndale's Bible. Eighty, ninety, some, I don't know, percent of the English in the King James Version is, is straight out of Tyndale. Yes? Um, the Geneva Bible. Yes. In the comments of this, it says revisions of great Bible with Calvinistic notes. What does that mean? Is it, is it, I mean, it's it, still it, a Bible it, like what we have? It, it now, you look uh, to, uh, to in the left column, it, there's the great Bible uh, 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 that was done by Miles Coverdale. And this is a revision uh, of, of the great Bible. Close, or close, is close. There, is there like, because it says with Calvinistic notes, I mean, is there... Is well, those are marginal notes, marginal notes. Okay. In the Geneva Bible, there were marginal ex, or explanatory notes. In the, in the Bishop's Bible, these were removed. Okay, so it's kind of like a study Bible, maybe? A study, you got it, a study, study Bible, yeah. Notes on the side about what you're reading. Yeah, yeah, e explanatory notes, there you got it. Now, uh, 1611, and we just uh, celebrated, of course, in 2011, the 400 years of the King James Bible, which really uh, held sway going to be back to that much because it's important later on. But in 1611, the English language was at its peak. This was the era of Shakespeare. And the translators took the language of that time, the flow, the beauty, the dignity of it, will never be excelled. Uh, so for the KJV. But the KJV is basically uh, a redoing of, of Tyndale. Then let's go down to uh, the next thing that was really done was the English Revised Version. And uh, this did not take hold over here because uh, the English have, still do, many phrases and expressions that are not, there, there's a difference between British English and American English, that's all. Uh, today, still, 
Do you know what, what a, a tube, a pram, a telly, you, you know, a tube? That's a subway. A uh, pram? No. Is that a crib? Uh, pr a pram, it's short for a preambulator. A baby buggy. A pram. How about a bonnet? <laughs> and a telly. Television, yeah, and on, on, and on it goes. There's, you know, this story about after World War II, uh, uh, an American soldier, because we had troops in England, a lot of them, uh, saved the country for them if we hadn't gone in. And uh, so this American soldier is writing to his British buddy and says, closes his letter with, I hope to see your mug again. And this Brit, what mug? He could never figure that out. <laughs> you know, face. I uh, hope to see your mug again. The Brit never figured it. The difference, well, that's, that's why that gave rise to the American Standard Version, which followed the text rather literally in 1901. Uh, it was rather wooden. It, it lacked the flow, the beauty of the King James. A good translation, but it never took hold. It was used in some Bible colleges and, and, uh, and seminaries, but that's as far as it got. Can I ask, at the English Revised, what are the principles of Westcott and Horse? Are those scholars? Or? <laughs> English Revised Version, it says they use textual principles of Westcott and Horse. Oh, that's the Greek text. Okay. That's the Greek text. Two British scholars, B. F. Westcott and 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 Hort, uh, used the available uh, manuscript evidence at that time. That uh, they had Vaticanus, they had uh, uh, Sinaiticus and put together, and that Greek text held for a long time. Westcott and Hort was just the standard, the standard Greek, uh, Greek text. All right, then come these modern speech translations and so on. Now, let's go to the back side of this sheet. Uh, the Revised Standard Version. The New Testament came out in 1946, uh, at which time I was a student at the Moody Bible Institute, and I wanted a copy, and the Moody Bookstore did not have it because the faculty had not given approval yet for it to be sold there. So I walked downtown and got a copy, came back, read through it in one day. The death knell of the RSV was really in 52 when the Old Testament came out and translated Isaiah 714 that uh, instead of a virgin shall conceive a child, a young maiden. And so uh, evangelical churches really steered away from the RSV from that time on. Now, you have a number of others here. Someone mentioned the Amplified. Here we have it, Berkeley, New English, New American Bible, New Standard, Living, Living Bible. Kenneth Taylor, this is quite a story. You ought to read sometime uh, Kenneth Taylor's. I hope we have it in the library. If we don't, we should get it. Kenneth Taylor's autobiography. It, it, it's an amazing story. Uh, and the Living Bible really started. He had 
11, 12 kids, and he started doing a paraphrase, not really a translation, for his kids. And uh, uh, he started with the letters and then did some of the minor prophets, and finally it got to be the whole Bible. And this thing went into the millions. What took off, of course, was when uh, uh, Billy Graham offered it to his vast television audience as a giveaway for a, a donation. And uh, then it became very, very popular after that. New King James Reader's Digest Bible is <laughs> exactly a, a, con, a condensation by elimination of, of duplicates. Uh, for instance, you know that First and Second Chronicles are pretty well duplicates. Kings and uh, the Gospels, so... Uh, there was a great furor, of course, as he, some of the Bible was being cut out. Well, uh, it claimed to be a digest, so what would you expect? And, of, of course, if in a church service you read a chapter from the Bible, you left 1,188 out, you know, so you shrunk it down. If you read a verse, you left the chapter out. Uh, so we do quite a bit of digesting, uh, not being too, too aware of it. But this sheet will give you kind of a preview of, of where we're going in, in these. There, there have never been so many translations of the Bible as there have been during our lifetime. And as you see from these dates, the bulk of these modern speech ones, and that's what uh, Berkeley and uh, Jerusalem, New English, New American, what all of these are, are in our lifetime. They've come in the last half of the uh, 20th century from 1950 to the year 2000. There's just been no, no end to them, it seems. Questions over this? Yes. Um, under the Good News Bible, it's... Um uses principles of dynamic equivalence. So, and as a simplified vocabulary, is that what it means? Dynamic equivalent or simplified vo vocabulary? Last week we got into this somewhat. There are people who say, we'll review, people who say, I want a literal translation, a word-for-word -word translation. No, you don't. Uh, uh, I gave you that on John 3.16. Uh, so people who say that. And then you've got idioms, every language. The nightmare of the translator is, is the idiom in a language. How a peculiar word or saying that frankly is almost untranslatable. What do you do with it? You, you, you've got those. So the opposite of this, quote, literal translation is a dynamic translation. A good example would, would be the NIV. Uh, but you were looking at good news. Uh, NIV is an example of uh, a dynamic translation. In other words, you don't try to stay real close to the exact word order or something. Okay, I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, what that yeah. Now, I'm, I'll say again, 
I, 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 Mike. Yeah, um, I have a question about that, as a matter of fact, because I have a NIV study Bible, and I believe last week you said that the dynamic translation, as you said, is good for reading, but not for study. <laughs> it's not Should a... Should I get a different Bible? <laughs> it's not a close translation. Uh, the New American Standard, or the uh, ESV, would be better for, for study. That I don't want a literal translation, and I'm not interested in a dynamic translation. I am interested in an accurate translation. That's what I want. And whatever it takes, of, and my example always is that, that little uh, phrase uh, that Paul picks up in Romans chapter 6, which is in the King James, God forbid, which uh, any, anybody who says the King James is a word for word, you take them to Romans 6. God forbid. The word God isn't in the Greek, and the word forbid isn't in the Greek, but I'm claiming it is a terrific and very accurate translation. It's a Greek idiom, and it's just very hard to get it into English. It's an exclamation, really. And uh, never in a thousand years, under no circumstances, you know, not over my dead body, but... Uh, uh, God forbid is, is, and it should have an exclamation point after it also. Yes? Is ESV on the list? No, I don't think so. On here. <laughs> okay. you, you're not going to find any list with all of them. Okay. I, then um, why was ESV chosen instead of New American Standard for our corporate reading here? If you're Why? This, this is a, a, a blooming good question. <laughs> uh, you don't want to start using a translation that uh, uh, never gets off the end of the runway. I know churches that use the New American Standard Bible, which is a good translation, but how many, how many use it, you know? Where is it used? We pick the ESV because it seems to be more mainline as to usage. Awana picked it up and went ESV. The Gideons picked it up and went ESV. Oh, well, fine, you know, and uh, so on. The Southern Baptist uh, have Holman put out uh, a translation they've done, but only some Southern Baptists use it. I, I, I don't want to use a, a, a denominational translation. It's, you know, uh, you got to pick something that's... Uh, so someone comes to our church from who knows where, and we're using some strange translation that nobody heard of. It's, the problem. Uh, we want to avoid. We want to avoid that. Uh, certainly, uh, and uh, on it goes. And there will be some more. Uh, these are, are not. This is not all of them. The book will have more than these. So, any other questions? No. Yes. Under Tyndale. Manuscript. Okay. Wh where's that? Tyndale and another one also. Where? Under Tyndale Bible, the second. Uh, oh, okay. Ma manuscript, yeah. MSS manuscripts. Uh, Is there like Hebrew manuscripts? No. Greek. Greek. Hebrew Old Testament. Okay, this. This will sort of give you an overall view. The book will get down into more detail. It's the next chapter for next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that we do have your word. 
that it has not been lost, but we have it and we have it accurately. And we praise you for that in Jesus' name, amen.